everything. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is the mountain of a minute left. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah, Hallelujah.
think about what a process it's been. This wild six-year journey with Tom. Did Kevin start already? And now, here we are. At the moment of truth. You've just been mesmerized. Like, it's hard to put into words something so big. He's not going to give up. I couldn't imagine what he must have been going through that moment. I don't remember the first 50 feet of that pitch. I watch him go into the section where he had fallen so many times. I just hold my breath. You pull as hard as you can. 
move your feet. You're just trying not to tip over backwards. Put the heel on it. Slide the hand up. Take the heel off. Drop the right hand in. Heel back on. Left hand down. Heart rate starts to go up. My adrenaline starts going because he's still hanging on in this place that he had fallen so many times. Watching him do it, I was just awestruck. I was like, I can't believe that just happened. He did it. Freaking guy actually did this thing, right? You're like, what? After seven days, Jorgensen got past the most difficult. Jorgensen finally did make it. Kevin Jorgensen conquered pitch 15. Yes, he made it. And now it's upward. And you start thinking, well, is are his fingers OK? Can you do 16, 17? Is this over yet? I had just finished the hardest pitch of my life, and I couldn't even celebrate. I just need to catch up. The next pitch has this big dyno that's so hard that Tommy can't do it. He's got to climb around it. There's no way in hell that I'm going to try Tommy's crazy loop pitch. So that same night, I start trying the eight and a half foot dyno. <laughs> 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 Kevin, through some kind of magic or levitation, actually does this dyno that Tommy was never able to do. So good. Well, tonight, Kevin Jordan's in now, a just a few hundred feet Kevin. behind Caldwell. All these hard pitches just keep coming. 17, 18, 19. It was like a fight to the death. Oh, no. That is a bad hold to rip off. Oh, I think it's a lot harder now. It didn't take him too long to figure it out. Nice, KJ. Just a little more tension. I think we need more of that on this route. <laughs> the last pitch getting to Wino Tower, this crazy fog came in. Kevin sends this pitch right now. He's going to be caught up with me. I just remember seeing Tommy at the anchor and having such a huge wash of gratefulness. Ah, I can't believe we're here. <laughs> so good, man. Oh. We're reunited in our high points now. I can't believe I did it. <laughs> Going up from there on out together to the top. I was sitting on five days rest while I caught up. I'm pretty sure he's gonna pull me up the wall today. I'm here for it, it's just a matter of grinding and out. So we get up and we stay 300 feet from the top. We wake up this last morning, the sun comes on the dawn wall. hits the top of the wall first, and we're like the only thing in Yosemite actually in the sun. So happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good moment right here. Oh my god. This is definitely a good moment. 
Yeah. Getting any better than this? <laughs> I'm just enjoying my last day well being up here with my friend. I think we should just stay in it. <laughs> <laughs> just cancel the whole thing. We're going to stay up here for another day. <sighs> Living on a wall where everything is so simple for 19 days. We were going to miss that experience. Good morning to our viewers. Uh, it's been an exciting 24 hours here in Yosemite. It's been 19 days on the wall. There were 15 TV trucks, reporters from all over. There was a webcam. Millions of people were actually watching this live. It became like a moon landing or something. Yes. A lot of their friends and family had come out. I mean, a number of people hiked up El Cap the back way. And you could sort of watch these guys go up. The final pitches, and they're cheering them on. It's going to be awesome. Seeing Tommy do the Don Wall, I was super happy for him. Just knowing how much was emotionally wrapped up in the route for him, I was really, you know, proud of him. Actually seeing he was going to complete this climb, it was just, <sighs> After 19 days, Tommy Caldwell pulling himself over the edge of the Don Wall. <laughs> Followed minutes later by climbing partner Kevin Jorgensen. cheered as the two men accomplished a feat many said was impossible. There are a lot of moments that kind of choke me up in sports anymore. I've been doing this too long. I'll never forget a scene of them, you know, rejoicing. <laughs> This is the moment that has been so many years in the making. Now forever enshrined in history. Inspiring millions around the world, even at the White House, where President Obama gave a thumbs up. It's done. It's done. Well, you are shaking like a leaf. Yeah, are you cold or are you emotional? I'm emotional. Okay. He's worked so hard for this. That moment he describes as bittersweet. This whole experience that drove him for so long was over. Anything that you would like to say about El Cap? I'm totally falling in love with a piece of rock. It's, uh, it's been a big centerpiece of my life, and I just feel so thankful every day. Hello everyone at CIC, welcome to our service, online service today in the last part series of The Dawn Wall. If you haven't watched the movie yet, once again I invite you, encourage you to watch the movie because it's an awesome, awesome movie. Anyone have fear of heights? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody in the room? Okay, okay, fear of heights. I mean, to some extent, I think we all have fear of heights, right? So nowadays, like some people, when they go on an airplane, they take... Uh, a little, I mean, I don't know, a dog or something. They, some of the airlines allow this, right? Comfort creatures that gives us soul comfort, right? I mean, whether it's the Empire State Building or the Space Needle in Seattle or maybe the Lotte Tower in Gangnam, I mean, some people are into that, but some people have huge fear of heights. Riding an airplane is the same thing. That's why some people refuse to ride an airplane and travel that way. There was this one person whose dream actually was to travel to Hawaii. That was this lady's, you know, life dream. But the problem was she had the fear of heights. What do you do? I mean, you have to go all the way to Hawaii. That's your goal, that's your dream, but what can you do? You're gonna take a ship, you're gonna take a cruise, you're gonna swim, I don't think so, right? So this lady decides to pray. That's a great choice, right? Because when we run into a wall one of the best things that you could ever do is come to God, stop, and pray. So she decides to pray, Dear God, I have this wish, just one-time wish, 
my, my, my dream is to travel to Hawaii because I heard how beautiful it is. The ocean, the water, the sand, the beach, just, just the smell, everything about it. The pine tree, everything. So, but I have this fear of heights. So can you just somehow, somehow, since I can't take the airplane, I can't ride the plane, can you somehow make, make, make a highway from where I am, where I live, and all the way to Hawaii? Ooh, could you do that? God responds to her surprise. Ah, uh, that's a way, way tall order. I don't think I can quite meet that expectation. I don't think I can answer your prayer. Do you have any other needs? Do you have any other prayer requests? She thought for a moment. She said, ah, that's too bad. But in that case, could you just then please change my husband's personality? God says, ah, no, 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 no. Okay, what was your first request? What was your first first prayer request? Did you, did you want that highway to be two-lane or, or four-lane highway? I think I'll do that for you. Get the story? That's how much it's difficult for us, for us humanoids, to change. It's a joke. It's a funny story. And God obviously wouldn't respond that way to our prayers, right? Uh, but why, you know, what is, what is God saying here in that story? It's way more difficult to change your husband. It's way, way easier for me to, you know, make that highway for you. But anyway, uh, it may be a silly story that someone made up, but the moral of the story is what, what? Just like I've shared, it's that difficult for us to change, whether it's our personality, our, our lifestyle, our habits, our thought patterns. It's hard for us humanoids to change. There are lots of things in life that just doesn't seem to make sense. And, and change is, is one of those things. Change of environment, change of habits. We can't fully comprehend all of that. There are certain things that we just can't seem to understand. Today's story is like that. It's about a man who bought property in war zone. I mean, can you imagine that? Buy land, piece of property, right smack in the middle of war? Come on, are you kidding? But in Jeremiah 32, this actually happens because Jeremiah is asked to buy land when there's actually war that's taking place. The land is practically, practically being ruined because of war. Not only that, everyone's trying to escape that area. I mean, who'd want to stay? Who'd want to live in that kind of condition and environment? And, and, and not only that, who'd want to buy land? Right? In the middle of war. How crazy is that? But guess what? That's exactly what Jeremiah is being asked to do. By whom? By God. Buy this land, Jeremiah. What would you do if you were being asked to buy a piece of land in the middle of a war zone. I think I'd probably try to persuade God, God, come on, come on. Don't you have a, a better idea, a better plan, a better suggestion than this one? You can't be for real. Are you kidding me? I mean, that's, that would be such a waste, God. Why? Why would you want to do that? The crazy thing is we may not, we may not see God's intent in that very moment. We certainly can't see the value of such a choice, right? It sounds so outlandish. It just doesn't make any sense. But you know what? This is what God's people do at times. And that's what we're asked to do at times. It may not make sense to others. It may not even make sense to us. It may actually seem quite foolish and silly. And they may even argue that they're right. They may try to prove and convince us that they're right. And the choice that we're about to make is just foolish. This is exactly the situation Jeremiah was in. They probably thought that he, he lost it. He was out of control. He was out of his mind. But what does Jeremiah do? He follows God's orders. He follows God's plans. Even though he didn't fully understand it, probably he obeys. You know what Jeremiah accomplished in this process? It wasn't just a piece of land that he purchased because what he had purchased was the future. That's the crazy part of this story. He had bought future hope. He purchased the land that God was going to work in through his people. 
That was God's plan. Not just buying a piece of property. God doesn't need land. He doesn't need property. But he wanted that land to provide hope in the future for the coming generation who were to live in that land. It's a war-torn land right now, but no, not in the future. Not in God's plan. Because God is able to restore broken land just like he's able to restore broken people, broken dreams, and broken lives. That's what God is good at. He's a pro at that. I'm not encouraging us to all of a sudden go out and buy land, you know. That's not what I'm asking you to do. That's not my message today at all. But there are things in life that just doesn't seem to make sense to us in the moment. What God is asking us to do may even sound strange and, and impractical at times. And it leaves us confused, distorted. Just like Jeremiah. He too was in a predicament. What on earth is God saying? What on earth is God asking me to do? When everybody is saying, pointing their fingers at me saying, You're crazy, Jeremiah. Why are you buying land in this war-torn war situation? He may have thought that. It may have seemed like total waste. It may have seemed unrealistic and unreasonable. However, we have to remember that God can see things way more clearly. He can see farther than we. This movie, The Dawn Wall, is, is, is also like that. To most of us, it's just a huge wall, right? I mean, it may not even look all that attractive to us. Imagine being asked to climb this huge wall at Yosemite National Park. I mean, how can we do that? We'd say, you're out of your mind for doing that. You're risking your life for doing that. But for some, like Tommy and Kevin, this was an opportune moment. Yes, it may very light take their lives, but they were willing to risk it because they saw something beyond just a huge stone wall in front of them. It was more than just a challenge. It was more than just some dream. It was more than just entertainment. They didn't see it as mere entertainment, but they saw an opportunity for hope through this process. If they made it to the top, if they were successful, they would be able to encourage other people who had lost their dreams, who had stolen dreams, who had lost all hopes. That was their purpose. They figured people with broken dreams and wounds may be able to see hope and may be able to regain strength once again. Just maybe they would see beyond what looks like an impossibility. This is what kept them going. This is what kept them climbing. They didn't care what people around them thought. They didn't even care if they fell and died. There may be things that feel crazy and doesn't make, you sense, doesn't make sense. There may be things that seem fuzzy for us due to COVID-19 these days. I mean, sometimes I feel lost. I feel confused. Schools, you know, job market. I mean, our normal life. The way we used to live and do things and interact with people and, and church life and all of that just seems like history. It's, it's something in the days gone by and everything just right now seems abnormal. Nothing seems to feel right. Nothing seems to be right. Nothing seems to be functioning normally. We can't even travel. We can't go meet. We can't even go meet our family and loved ones. It seems crazy. We may not even be able to see things as clearly as we used to. Everything just seems out of whack and fuzzy. But sometimes, God uses those moments to clarify and shows us a better way. It may help us to see the value of family. It may help us to see in these moments the value of friends. It may help us to see value of work, value of church, value of play, value of fun value of everything in a new way, in a different way. That's what Anathas feel was like in Jeremiah 33. Listen to God's word in Jeremiah 33, verse 6. This is what God says. As crazy as the whole idea was, it seemed, of buying this land, this property, right in the smack in the middle of war, God says, I will bring health and healing to it. To that land, right? I will heal my people who, are to, who is going to occupy that land at some future time. 
I will heal my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. What seems like a war-torn torn land right now, it's not going to remain that way. It's not going to stay that way. No, because I have another plan. I have a better plan, which is to restore that land and restore its people. That was God's plan. That's what Anathoth's field was like. It didn't make sense, but it required vision. It required courage. It required Jeremiah to see beyond himself. And that's what sometimes God invites us to do. What? To see beyond ourselves. God's plan may seem crazy. It may seem foolish. It may not make sense. But God knows way better, right? And remember, to a lot of people, Jeremiah's investment seemed utterly foolish to their eyes. It looked absolutely crazy. But you see, in reality, God was asking Jeremiah to invest in people, not property. He was asking Jeremiah to invest in lives, not land. God was saying, I'm going to do amazing things on that barren land. I'm going to work in people's lives who would eventually live in that land called Anathoth's field. You see what I'm going to do? Can you imagine, Jeremiah, what I'm going to do at some future point in life? You just watch and see what I'm about to do because I'm going to restore that land and I'm going to bring healing and restoration to its people. You see, I don't think Jeremiah understood all of that. But he still followed. He still obeyed. He followed God's orders because he knew that God would make a way. Can we understand what Jesus did for the likes of you and me? What he did, what he had to give up. And does that make sense to us? As familiar we may, as we may be about the messages and the stories and the gospels that we read, can we really fully come to grips with all of that? The idea of God becoming man and human flesh coming to rescue us and save us and be our friend doesn't make sense. But he did it. He had to die for us, to redeem us. That doesn't make sense to us. It seems crazy. It seems way far out. But he responded to his father's call, right? Why? Because he saw that our lives mattered. He saw beyond himself. He saw the desperate condition in which the human race was in. And he decided that something had to be done even though it required his very life. He couldn't give up on us because nothing would stop his love. Today, we're going to participate in a time of communion. So. Like I asked you last week, if you have your bread and wine ready, we're going to we'll be sharing that in a moment. If you have prepared bread and juice in your home, uh, I'd like to invite you to participate with your family. And before we begin, I'm just going to read the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, if you have prepared bread like this, this actually represents what the Bible says and in an imagery form it reminds us of Jesus actual human body and he said this body of his was broken for us whatever pain whatever hardships whatever difficulties that we experience day to day Jesus says I know your story I know your pain why because he's experienced it all. He's experienced betrayal. He's experienced all types of pain. He's experienced hardship. He's experienced even death. 
So whatever pain and difficulty and trials that we are facing, he's saying, I've been there. I know your story. He said, this body was broken for you. So if you can take a piece with me, after we bow for a moment of prayer, and when you're ready, you can take part in this communion. Not only was Jesus' body broken for us, for our sins, to redeem us, but He shed His blood, which is represented in this grape juice or wine that we share in communion. And He says, share this as well in remembrance of the sacrifice that He made on our behalf. And again, Whatever difficulty and challenge that we may be going through right now, the reminder is this, that He is there with us. He's in your pain. He's part of your, he's, He sees, He relates with the troubles and the challenges that you face today. So remember that, that He's right there in the here and now with us as you partake the glass of the juice that you may have prepared. Let's take a moment of prayer. Let's pause and then we can celebrate and partake together in this communion as a family. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your presence, your abundant love in each and every one of our lives. We thank you for the invitation that we have to participate in communion, which represents your body, your blood. Thank you so much for redeeming us and for being our Savior and our Lord. Help us to follow you to the end of our lives. Thank you again for your love for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen.